The meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Good evening. I'm now calling the Tuesday, February 16th, 2021, regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to order. The time is 7.03 p.m. Please note that in order to support physical distance during, distancing during the local public health emergency and in accordance with Governor Newsom's executive order that relax Brown Act rules during the public health crisis center, conducting the meeting via video conference. Because we are video conferencing, we'll follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when commissioners, staff, presenters, and the public will provide comments. If you have called into the meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing your comment. For the benefit of the recording, please practice considerate video conferencing edit, uh, etiquette by muting your line when you're not speaking and limiting distracted behavior on the camera. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Great. Uh, good evening, commissioners. So I will be conducting all roll call this evening in the same order. Please remember the order so that you are prepared to provide your comments or vote. President Warren? Present. Vice President Vaughn? Present. Good to see you again. Uh, Commissioner Kearney? Present. Commissioner Sherlock? Present. Commissioner Spreen? Present. And Commissioner Tonka? Yeah. Uh, I forgot one. And Commissioner Tyson? Here. <laughs> yes. All right. And all commissioners are present. And I'm also going to, for the benefit of the recording, uh, conduct a roll call of presenters, consultants, and staff. Um, Assistant Fire Chief Glass? Present. Good evening. Okay. And uh, Fire Chief Bowden, are you on the line? I am. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Um, District Consulting Engineer Jeff Tarantino? Present. Strate strategic Planning Consultant Scott? Here. Okay. Records Management Consultant Con I'm gonna, Conquelino? Oh, she's actually going to join a little bit later. Okay, wonderful. Um, Emergency Services Manager Captain Gluhan? Present, thank you. General Manager Logan? Uh, present, thank you. Okay. District Legal Representatives, uh, we have Lead Deputy County Counsel Chelladen? Present, thank you. And Assistant County Counsel Coelho? He's not present. Um, CERT Program General Analyst BB? Present. Special Projects Services Consultant Hendricks? Present. Okay, and presenters, consultants, and staff are all accounted for. Great. Thank you, Corey. <clears throat> all right, that allows us to move on to item two, So, um, which is Commission um, President's remarks. So first of all, I want to start by welcoming everyone to the meeting tonight, February uh, 2021. Um, so obviously, um, what's... Uh, it is a special night in that we have 2.5 new commissioners. Um, Roger, I consider you 0.5. You're a retread. No insult <laughs> taken. So I'd like to give the uh, the new commissioners a, a moment to introduce themselves. Um, uh, Kavita, I'll start with you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, um, I'm glad to be part of the Fire Commission. I actually got engaged when I was part of a subcommittee with, uh, count, uh, with uh, Council Member Corrigan, uh, working with uh, Supervisor Joe Smidian's office in the wake of the proposed consolidation and the audit report. I now serve on the Los Altos Hills City Council, and I am the, one of the council representatives to uh, the Los Altos Hills uh, County Fire District Fire Commission. Thank you, Kavita. Look forward to welcome, uh, working with you. Joan, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the welcome. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Los Altos Hills, except for a stint in Berkeley <clears throat> after I went to school there for a bit. And um, I was lucky to be involved with Mike Saunders and a lot of the work that we did back around forming the CERT um, the whole CERT community and starting the neighborhood network program. And so I feel like I've got a long history with the fire district and it's wonderful to be able to get back. Great, thank you. Welcome, Joan. Thanks. And Roger, Roger, I've got to give you the, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to introduce yourself. Oh, I think everyone knows me for better or for worse. Uh, and I should probably save my spare minutes for other times when I talk too long. So uh, I will right. be brief in my 
a pleasure to be back at the dais instead of the virtual public seats like last meeting. Last month. Well, welcome back, Roger. <laughs> From your time in the wilderness. All right. We'll now move to item three, public comment. Uh, persons wishing to address the commission on any subject not on the agenda may do so now. Please note, however, the commission is not able to undertake extended discussions or actions tonight on items not on the agenda. Items may be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on the next available agenda. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker, unless the number of speakers uh, requires the commission president to impose a shorter time limit. Do we have any public comments on items not on the agenda at this time? Don't see any hands raised. I don't see Corey. anyone. All right. Okay. Seeing none or hearing none, we'll now move to item four, the consent calendar and changes to the order of the board uh, of the order of the board of commission agenda. All right. So we're moving to item four, consent calendar and changes to the order of the board of commissioners agendas. I, this is items A through F. All right. So are there any comments from staff on these agenda and or consent items for A through F, please? Um, I just like to point out that uh, maybe a couple hour and a half, half an hour or two hours ago, um, I sent an updated 4C. So what will be approved tonight is the update with additional disbursements for February. That's all. Great. All right. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions from the commissioners on these items or would any commissioner like to make changes to the consent calendar or order of the agenda? All right, great. Hearing none, I will now entertain a motion. Will the commissioner making the motion and the commissioner seconding the motion please state their names for the benefit of the recording. Tyson moves to accept the consent items. Thank you, George. You have a second, please. I say a second, Kavita Tanka. Thank you, Kavita. Right in there, jumping right in. <laughs> I'm just glad George just beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the item is open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Is there any public comment on this item? All right, hearing none, if there's no further discussion, we'll now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call vote. Corey, you're frozen on my screen. Corey? Uh, she appears no, to be frozen. Oh, there. there she is. <laughs> there she's You're back. Okay. <laughs> now we can hear you. Corey, you're freezing on us. <clears throat> okay, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, why is it? it I'm in a different place and it did this to me the last time. Anyway, okay. Uh, President Warren? Yes. Vice President Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Kearney? Yes. Commissioner Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. The only caveat being I will abstain from 4A since I was not there at the January 19th meeting. Okay. And then uh, Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Okay. So the motion passes. We've got uh, seven to zero, except um, abstain on the uh, 4A. 4A. Mm -hmm. One abstention. One abstention, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So the motion passes. Thank you. We'll now move to item five, the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Management Audit. Items 5A and 5B are, ver are the various monthly reports presented to the County of Santa Clara. Item 5C is the final request for proposals for input and responses for the LAFCO Fire Services Review. General Manager Logan, please provide the report. Uh, thank you, Board President Warren. 
Uh, for the information of the new commission members and really as a review to ongoing commissioners, I would just like to recount that the Board of Supervisors action on October 6th of 2020 required district administration to present monthly reports for a year to the County Finance, Government and Operations Committee and the Hewlett Committee, and that is Housing, Land Use, Environment and Transportation. So each month a report is sent to, these, to the Management Audit Division and then after review of the district report, the Management Audit Division provides its cover letter and assessment to the county committees. A PowerPoint of the report was requested by chairperson of the FGOC committee, uh, item 5A. Uh, in the January report and PowerPoint with the cover letter to the county commissions, the monthly report is a matrix format with the first column that's the management audit recommendation. The second column is the district's response to the recommendation. And the third column is the monthly progress made toward attaining this recommendation. Uh, and the recommendations were adopted by the Board of Supervisors. The PowerPoint is a summary of the January progress made toward a, obtaining the adopted recommendations. Today, uh, Commissioner Tyson and I appeared in front of the Hewlett Committee and that was a committee chaired by a president of the Board of Supervisors, Mike Wasserman, and the, the vice chair is Joe Submidian. So we submitted this January report this afternoon at two o'clock. I just wanted to mention that item 5B on the agenda, and you have the documents for 5B, is the Management Audit Division report and their three slides to the committee of its assessment of the district's report. And the management audit cover letter states, in conclusion, we believe that the fire district has implemented or is on track to implement the audit recommendations as adopted by the Board of Supervisors. The PowerPoint slide from the management audit division states, in short, we do not have any concerns about the district's implementation of the audit recommendations as adopted by the Board of Supervisors. And then to note uh, the reference uh, to, the board of, to, to the board in the audit recommendation, the board references the County Board of Supervisors who sit as the board of directors for Los Altos Hills County Fire District. So these documents are attachments in the agenda packet. Item 5C is the LAFCO agenda item for the request for proposals for the LAFCO Fire Service Review and contains a letter from Los Altos Hills County Fire District and other agencies. And then there's the LAFCO response to those letters. So thank you, President Warren. That's the end of my report. Great, thank you, General Manager Logan. Is there any discussion from the commission? Let me just say it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to have to to sit in on these meetings because I have really nothing to do. It's uh it's all I do is bask in the glow of the the well prepared documents and presentation and answers to questions that General Manager Logan routinely provides. Thank, Thank you for those kind words, George. Thank you, Commissioner Tyson. I would like to mention that these uh, meetings are recorded. And I would encourage commission members to go back, let's say to today, go to the Board of Supervisors meeting portal, portal, toggle down to Hewlett and watch the video. We're the very first item aboard after public comment. And I think you'll see a very nice foundation laid on behalf of Supervisor Submidian to get into the record, the activities that the district is doing around its hydrant maintenance and uh, uh, program and water supply program, and also around records and around uh, integrated hazardous fuel reduction. So Commissioner Tyson, I see I'm, re I'm responding to that properly because I see the nodding of the head, but it was about five, seven minutes uh, where a very nice foundation was laid as we're showing not only are we complying with the recommendations, but also the advancements that we're making in a very rapid order to do a lot of things above and beyond what the district was doing a year ago or six months ago. So thank you for those extra comments. Great. All right, is there any public comment on this item? All right, seeing none, thank you. We will now move to item six, which is Santa Clara County Fire Chief Report, item 6A. Receive, uh, 
received the monthly report for January 2021. Assistant Fire Chief Glass, please provide the report. All right, good evening commissioners, member of the public and members of staff and welcome to the new commissioners and welcome back to the returning commissioners. Um, just so that we walk through the initial report for the commissioners that may have never seen this document before, this is a, a monthly appraisal of the performance of the Santa Clara County Fire Department as we provide operational services to the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. This is a standardized report that we deliver to all the seven communities that we serve. Um, and on the initial page that you're looking at here, page one, it systematically walks through and corresponds to page two. So items numbered one would be the year to date count. Um, two would be incident by month, uh, incident response uh, by hour of day and, and so forth through. Um, the one that we really draw attention to is, is number one, uh, excuse me, which is a dollar loss, which is significant events, which is precedes number one. This is where if we had any fire loss, we would wanna report that immediately to the district to make sure that you understand where we have that fire loss and be able to answer any of those significant questions that the commission may have. Thankfully in the month of January, we didn't have any fire loss and we had no significant events. We just had that standard run of the mill emergency, which is still an emergency, but doesn't draw or, or rise to the level of, of significance. Uh, page two, please, Sarah. So on page two, you can see incident count by year to date. This is a rolling total. Um, and so where we're sitting right now for 2021 is at 72 calls that, is, that corresponds with incident count by month. So. January 2021, it shows 72 and the, the numbers look good. We're seeing a little bit of an increase as we start to emerge from the COVID-19 uh, kind of pandemic. As people start to return to work a little bit, we have vaccines being rolled out. We're starting to see an, an uptick in call volume, not just within Los Altos Hills County Fire District, but throughout the district. Um, Incident count uh, by hour of day, this kind of shows as we go through using a 24 hour clock where the peaks and valleys are and uh, the orange is the incidence and the blue is the weight of the response. So as you see at about 12 o'clock, that value where the orange is at about 40 to 60 call volume, we're seeing a larger response force. And that's what that blue is showing. That's additional resources that have to be, be A, respond from the fire district and B, receive support throughout the district. Incident count by type, we break it down um, into kind of general uh, categories, EMS, service calls, fire alarms, and hazardous conditions. Of course, if we would have had fires, those would have been broken out. Um, and this is pretty consistent with our average across the board. 60 to 80% of the call volume the fire uh, department responds to is EMS related. And here you can see we're showing 54%. The other 30% is service call. For the most part, we lump that into EMS. Those are typically like the, the pickup and the put back and the helping the uh, elderly citizen uh, within the community. It doesn't truly qualify as an EMS call, but still is a valuable service provided by the fire service to um, the constituents. Um, there's a cute little pie graph and the colors always change depending on the amount of volume of calls and the specific type that we have. Um, one thing that we always want to highlight is our average response times by unit. This is always code three, which is the red lights and sirens. You'll see sometimes within the report, we'll break down a distinction between what we call code two, which is no red lights and no sirens, and code three. Here, our average response time, we're always shooting for within urban densities under seven minutes and 59 seconds. Here you can see for all units within the district, we met that goal. Uh, for rural densities, we're looking for 11 minutes, 59 seconds, and you can see we've met that goal for all calls within the rural um, area that we serve. Again, dollar loss for January is zero. Community education risk reduction activities that occurred within the community. This was one virtual and one uh, Pinewood Elementary upper campus um, school alarm test that occurred. So this is just a brief overview and we'll transition to page three. This is a, uh, obviously highlighted within purple is the actual fire district boundary. And uh, we also show just for comparison, Los Altos um, as, as well outside of the boundary, but this is a disbursement of the calls. Uh, red, red dots, uh, bright red dots that are larger. You can see one on the north end up by West El Camino and what would that be, San Antonio. That shows what we would, if you would have had a fire that would have uh, that's what the color you would be looking at. It's brighter red and larger in color, so it's easier to identify. The rest of the color, calls are uh, color coordinated and there's a key at the bottom and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that the commission may have. Class? Yes, sir. Commissioner Carney. 
I have a question um, about the percentage of your crews that have been vaccinated. How's that looking? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, uh, beginning uh, early January, I was tasked by Chief Bowden to support the county's vaccination effort at the fairgrounds. And so County Fire has an 85% vaccination rate and a 15% declination. Some of that was due to the fact that we have personnel that were positive with COVID or in quarantine or otherwise ineligible to receive the vaccine. Uh, and so we're continuing to work with County Public Health to vaccinate that remaining 15%. There is a small portion that just absolutely does not want the vaccine. We respect those, uh, those people's wishes uh, at this point. Great, thank you. Yeah, Chief, is, Chief is that what first vaccination or both shots? So at 85 percent. Uh, we are at 85 percent with first dose, and we're okay. at 75 percent complete with second dose vaccinations. So again, true efficacy of the vaccine it requires two weeks post second dose. So we won't look at the full effect uh, of 100 percent. You know, the high percentage, 96 to 98 percent vaccination for another two weeks. So we're hoping by early March we'll have 85 percent vaccination, first and second dose, plus two weeks for all responders within the organization. I believe Chief Bowden wants to make a comment. Great, thanks. Um, good evening, everyone. I really wanted to just express um, a heartfelt welcome to our, our new commissioners, uh, Commissioner Sherlock and Commissioner Tonka, welcome. Um, Commissioner Spring, you'll always be a full 100% with me. It's been awesome working with you, and I'm excited to continue to work with you. Uh, for our new commissioners, you'll see Chief Glass on uh, many of the meetings, um, and that's because we have seven cities. And interesting enough, most of the city council meetings in our fire district occur on Tuesday evenings. And so I'll bounce around with different council meetings and um, try to come on to this meeting as, as much as I possibly can. So we assign a liaison, which is the assistant chief, Chief Glass. And, and, and I, I also want to just add on um, the, the previous FGOC and, and Hewlett meetings with General Manager Logan. It's been fantastic uh, to be able to support uh, the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. I think the partnership with Central Fire and Los Altos Hills on those meetings have been evidence and has really shown good solidarity in pushing forward um, how we're working very cohesively together. And so that's been great. Uh, I've been really appreciative. Uh, Jay, I'm just singling you out because it's been great working with you over the last couple months to kind of navigate through some of those muddy waters and, and I'm super happy you're still here with us as well. So. So that's it. And that's a good clap, George. George has been on too, so it's been great. <laughs> thank you, Chief. Appreciate those words. Great. All right, thank you, Chief Bowden, Chief Glass. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? Any comments or questions from the public? All right, thank you very much. Now we'll move to item seven, receive the general manager report. General, item 7A, General Manager Logan, please provide the report for items A through E. Okay, thank you so much, um, President Warren. Slide one of the slide deck, uh, you'll see that there were some slides added to the attachment, which was the slide deck presented at the Los Altos Hills uh, City Council at its goal set setting study session. And I was very appreciative that we received uh, the invitation to present information on the fire district as a global overview of what the fire district does. So uh, that went very well. And you know, thanks again to the council and to the city manager for that invitation. I think it echoes what Chief Bowden just uh, uh, mentioned, and that is the partnership and the close collaboration that has resulted after the October 6th meeting with, Kent, with um, the Board of Supervisors to really show our outreach to one another and to do such a good job in collaboration. So uh, that item is very important to point out uh, on one of the events, February 5th. And then the February 8th event is uh, a GIS meeting of links uh, for updating and planning. And I thought I would just give a quick overview of what that is all about. So the district is in the process of data collection and integration for its GIS mapping system for district assets and program locations and impacts. 
And I, Sarah, you're there, so maybe you'd like to make a couple of statements because you're kind of project managing the GIS implementation. Sure, thank you, General Manager Logan. So um, I'm Sarah Henricks. Uh, I'm Special Projects Services Consultant with the District for the new commissioners. Um, so I've been managing the GIS project, which was a long time coming. Uh, we've been working on getting it approved and, and ready to move forward since I came on last March. Uh, so I'm really excited to finally be moving on this project. Um, we've contracted with Lynx Technologies for our GIS services. Um, Patrick Kelleher uh, is, is the um, lead for Lynx and he actually did the GIS update for the town of Los Altos Hills. So we're really looking forward to having some very um, fine-tuned data. We, we have found in, in speaking with other agencies that some of the data that agencies are working with is not entirely accurate, but Lynx actually went out and manually verified all of the parcel information for the town of Los Altos Hills. And we've been working with uh, Zach Dahl, who's the planning manager in Los Altos Hills to make sure that we're using that same data and ours is as accurate as can be uh, possible. So that's the kind of the base map that we're gonna be using. And we're, we'll be combining that with the county data for all of our unincorporated areas. And in a phase two of the project, we'll look at um, qualifying all of that, quantifying it and making sure that it's accurate as well. Um, we do have a few different uh, data layers that we're going to be working on, hydrants, um, our area information, service area information, um, planning information from county fire, as well as some, as some other data pieces that are gonna be really important for visualizing what kind of programs and services the district is providing and telling a better story um, about how we're providing those services and how we can improve fire prevention and protection here in the district. And then Sarah, I think you're working with the CERT volunteers also to try to help them with their mapping for their zones. Yes, that's correct. So certs, uh, links won't necessarily be helping at that, with that uh, data piece right away. That's going to be a, a phase two, but we are um, getting some uh, guidance from Patrick about how the certs can provide that data themselves and really start tracking it so that when we are able to add it into our GIS, it's going to be seamlessly integrated and it'll be up and ready to go really quickly. And our cert volunteers can use that as they need to. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to mention the last point on, on the slide that you're looking at, uh, the report of a purchase and service plan for three first net cellular phones for the ARC. And that includes also uh, phones for the emergency containers. And these phones will be utilized um, through first access in event of an emergency to ensure connectivity to the cellular towers if, if service gets disrupted. And then when we're not in an emergency, the, the phones will be used for ongoing business of um, communications during non-emergency usage. So we're pleased to have that service plan soon up and running for those, for those individuals who, who work with emergencies. That would be um, CERT Program Manager Victoria Beebe and Emergency Services Manager Captain Gluhan. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, hydrant and related infrastructure update. February 10th convened the task force information uh, gathering meeting for our uh, with Central Fire, Prisma Hills Water District, Los Altos Town, and it was led by Jeff Tarantino, who is the lead uh, Friar and Loretta uh, engineering consultant. And you'll see the goal there for the um, uh, strategic plan, and this task force is addressing this goal. And we're seeking interface and feedback from our partners. And then there'll be a work group put together. And then from the work group, there'll be a standard operating procedures and policies and guidelines developed. So I think Jeff Tarantino's on the line. Jeff, do you wanna just make comment as to how the task force went and kind of your plans moving forward with it? Yeah, thank you, General Manager Logan. And uh, good evening, commissioners. Welcome to the new commissioners. Jeff Tarantino with uh, Friar and Loretta. Uh, our firm's principal in charge to provide on-call engineering services and uh, happy to be working with the with the general manager, the staff, and the commissioners. And so, yeah, you know, we had a, a very successful uh, meeting uh, with, with the task force for information gathering from our partners at Prisma Hills Water District, uh, the town, and and with uh, representatives from Central Fire, um, we we had a very good discussion about um, 
coordination that we've been doing uh, for recent hydrant strikes, uh, coordination for data management. And I think we've got some really good direction. So our working group, which is, which is going to consist of district staff, FNL, and Central Fire uh, to, to develop those uh, standard operating procedures that General Manager Logan described. And so um, we're um, kind of going over and documenting the discussions from the February 10th meeting. We'll be distributing meeting minutes and action items uh, to the task force and then uh, convening the work group over the next coming weeks uh, to develop uh, drafts, of the standard operating procedures, which we'll, we'll discuss with, with General Manager Logan and ultimately bringing those to the commission for consideration. So uh, I had nothing else to add. Thank you. Thank you. And Chief Bowden, uh, Assistant Chief Glass, I wanted to mention that uh, Deputy Chief Linney was on the call with us and was extremely helpful along with her staff, one both from operations and all from the De deputy fire marshal's office to be sure that the district understands the codes and the regulations and that we are compliant with those as we move forward with our water systems uh, to provide water for fire suppression. So thank you again, shout out to the uh, persons at Central Fire who are helping us with this. Thank you. Uh, next Very slide, well. Sarah. Um, and this also uh, is hydrant update uh, on Horseshoe Lane. We have a soil repair project going there. And Jeff, I'll ask you again if you could comment on that. And then also just the solicitation of bids for on-call contracting so we can have really rapid turnaround for struck hydrants. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so first, an up, update uh, as uh, some of the former the the commissioners that uh, were on the commission during last year. We've been working towards uh, resolving the soil erosion that was caused by a hydrant strike. Uh, you know, about a year ago now, um, we uh, have been working with the town to secure the final grading permit, um, and we did get some additional re data requests from the from the town here in the last couple of weeks. And so we are uh, bringing a geotechnical subconsultant under contract to. Have FNL out to the site to perform a site visit and observation um, and provide uh, responses to some of the questions that we received from town staff. Uh, C2R engineers who uh, is under contract for the work is ready to mobilize the site as soon as we receive the, uh, uh, um, excuse me, the grading permit. Um, we are targeting issuance of the grading permit within the next two to three weeks uh, as, we, as we work to resolve the final questions and comments from, from town staff. Uh, so that is the update on the Horseshoe Lane Soil Repair Project. Uh, and as General Manager Logan indicated, we are working with the uh, County Council's office to develop a solicitation for on-call contracts for rapid uh, repair of struck hydrants. Uh, over the last year uh, or so, uh, there have been several struck hydrants. And that, although we have uh, optimized and made our process for selecting uh, on-call uh, a contract to repair those more efficient, um, we did see an opportunity to improve uh, the response time. Uh, uh, which was actually an item of discussion during during the uh, task force information gathering meeting last week. And so with uh, guidance from County Council's office, uh, we have a template for um, uh, an on-call contract that FNL is, is, is refining and completing this week uh, that will uh, identify kind of standard scope items that would be uh, anticipated with any hydrant strike so that we can solicit competitive bids and develop a list of on-call uh, and select an on-call contractor that would be available uh, to, to repair uh, hydrant strikes when they occur. And again, the goal is to restore hydrant service as quickly as feasible uh, based on the conditions that we find in the field when, when when we are notified of a hydrant strike. Perfect, thank you. Next slide, Sarah. Okay, uh, we have a district parcel uh, that the district owns. And on February 3rd, I'd like to talk about uh, this site visit of district staff and FNL staff. And uh, Mr. Tarantino, I'll turn it over to you just to talk about what we're looking for. And basically it's the safety of the site after the property hygiene was done, and then also uh, observing where utility service could, could be uh, put in for the purposes of using that site as a staging area for fire protection in event of an emergency. Great, thank you, General Manager Logan. Uh, yes, uh, 
FNL staff, along with Emergency Services Coordinator uh, Captain Gluhan, we uh, performed a site visit on February 3rd. The goal of the site visit was to observe the existing conditions. Uh, as uh, Captain Gluhan has discussed in previous meetings, there was uh, uh, basically a, a hygiene cleanup of the site, removing brush and cutting back trees. And um, what we observed is uh, some discontinuity in, in the existing bollards and chains protecting uh, the portions of the site. Uh, uh, we also wanted to do a uh, understand the layout and kind of conceptualize uh, what kind of staging that could be accomplished uh, during an emergency uh, um, emergency condition. Uh, and Sarah, would you mind going to the next slide? And so. During that site visit, um, we were able to observe existing utilities uh, either serving the site or adjacent to the site. So those are water, electric, and communication. We observed the existing conditions of the driveway entrance to the site. Um, we also spent some time with Captain Gluhan, you know, walking the site and identifying potential uh, layouts for emergency uh, vehicle staging, as well as potential setup of a command center is, should that be warranted, uh, depending on the emergency condition. And so my team is working to develop a preliminary site plan. We have also engaged the services of a tra transportation uh, and traffic uh, planning consultant just to consider any additional safety enhancements that may be required. But at this point, we're anticipating completing some of the bollards along the, uh, the frontage of a Rastigadero uh, site and uh, developing potential uh, layout for staging of emergency services equipment. Once we develop that uh, site plan, including potential utility needs, um, we'll share that with district staff and, and uh, to continue to develop the improvement of the parcel if, if desired. Yeah, thank you. And then, of course, at that point, once we get the preliminary work done, we'll bring in the Central Fire and Chief Bowden, Assistant Chief Glass, you know, whomever you'd like to assign to this, this project. We're trying to get as much as the preliminary work done as possible now and then convene Central Fire for their input also. So we're sure that we've got a very strategically located district parcel with all the facilities necessary in the event of an emergency condition. Uh, thank you. Next slide which is a very interesting slide. Uh, this is a new, um, I think, um, uh, front by the state of California to really address a very important issue. And that is just insurance in WUI or wildland urban interface areas and the impact that fires, wildland fires are having on residents who are trying to insure their property. And it was a year ago, March, in fact, it was my last public meeting. I was with Insurance Commissioner Lara and uh, members of one of the members of the Board of Supervisors and other invited agencies. And we talked about what we could do to help ensure residents to be able to retain and receive home insurance if they're in these, these um, wildland fire areas. And to that end, uh, one of the uh, issues from Los Altos, one of the contributions from the district was to suggest to Commissioner Laura that some kind of credit be given for residents who engage in property hygiene and building hardening. And so I'm really pleased to see this partnership now at a state level that's going to acknowledge the importance of residents when they do uh, reduce wildfire risk and protect their lives and property through all the resources that the homeowner can do. So I just wanted to bring that to the attention and I think um, Commissioner Taika for sending me this information and uh, for other comments that I've had from other uh, partners about this, this possibility. So thank you. And then I think next slide pretty much finishes up. And if there's any questions, but uh, that's my presentation. Thank you, President Warren. Great, thank you, General Manager Logan. Is there any discussion from the commission? All right, is there any public comment on the item? I guess you can't see my hand. Um, oh, sorry, George. Go ahead, please. Yes, I just want to say that, you know, it's really hard to celebrate events during COVID. And so I made my wife walk with me to the district parcel on Valentine's Day. So I know you're all impressed by that. But you know, uh, it's the first time I set foot on it. And it's a it's a wonderful location. It's really been cleaned up. There's giant big flat area. It's perfect to kind of access. I'm just thinking we can we really have a jewel here. And it's even better with the property hygiene work that was recently done. And I think it's going to be a real powerful asset for us. 
Oh, thank you for saying that. And I agree. And uh, if you think of the proximity to Station 8 in the Foothill Park and what we have planned there, and then the whole uh, plan that we have for integrated hazardous fuel reduction up on, up on the west boundary, you can see the triangle that forms. And that's just a perfect staging location and with the shaded fuel break roads around it. So thank you, Commissioner, for taking that walk on Valentine's Day. Any other comments or questions from the commissioners? All right. Um, any public comment on this item? All right, hearing none, we'll now move to item B. Thank you, General Manager Logan. We'll now move to item eight, receive the emergency services manager report. Items eight A and B are the reports. Emergency services manager, Captain Gluhan and certain program analyst, BB, please provide the reports. Thank you, President Warren and uh, former commissioners and future commissioners that have joined us. Thank you, um, public and staff from County Fire and all the other administrative th staff. Thank you very much for joining us. I just want to really give a shout out just really quick um, because we have some new staff uh, or some new commissioners. Just the, the really the ground that we've made up in the last year um, and really that shows to uh, General Manager Logan and, and the staff and, and all the work that she's uh, arranged and put and coordinated. Um, the GIS, getting that going. Um, Chief Glass used a, a very similar to, uh, map that we would be able to show people showing our information in his report. So that's the type of thing that we're looking forward to being able to uh, show a real visual information of what we're doing. Um, and then getting the hydrants. Um, <laughs> You know, we had that that kind of uh, uncomfortable spot where we were separating a little bit with Preston Hills water and figuring out where we land with management audits. So thank you very much to uh, Jeff Charantino for all the interface and, and assistance on that. You've really helped get it uh, into a, a manageable program. And then um, and then just again that insurance commissioner um, standards coming out is really going to be, mm -hmm. I think, a strong framework that we already have started building on. But we I'll talk about we have firewise communities things like that that we're looking at. So again, the integrated hazardous fuel management program that we're working on, as General Manager Logan has said, this really is all tying together into a, you know, kind of something that we can show and, and really educate the public on uh, resiliency and, and self-reliance. So anyhow, next slide. Oh, um, one of the first uh, pictures on there that we have that was on the cover and here in this next one, uh, we have the, oops, one more back, a little too fast. I talk fast, but not quite that fast. So a couple of these events and activities off <laughs> have a, a little bit of um, crossover to some of the reports that we've already heard. Um, some of the meetings uh, I joined along with um, Victoria Beebe, who's now our CERT uh, general analyst. Uh, we have a monthly CERT meeting um, and that's in transition. We're moving from, uh, there's kind of be a, a, a kind of a staff meeting uh, prior to having the regular monthly uh, CERT meeting. So most of the CERT meeting, we invite two people from the CERT organizations along with their uh, representative staff to these meetings to work on training opportunities throughout the county, which is a very nice collaboration uh, for the CERTs to provide training. And it's been uh, difficult in COVID to, to make that happen. So we'll, Victoria will tell about what she's been doing. Uh, Fire Safe Council meeting today. Um, we've lost uh, Commissioner um, well, to having a new commissioner for having uh, joined us, but we have Joan Sherlock now who has served, uh, and thank you for serving on the Fire Safe Council for the last year. Really appreciate the time and energy that you've put into that to really help them. Uh, you got some kudos. I don't think you were on that, but you really helped to uh, move that organization in their organizational capacities um, and their strategic planning. So thank you. Uh, we continue to have public information um, PIO meetings, uh, which mostly focus on the vaccines at this point, but it also keeps us up on the COVID case counts and activity around COVID. Some additional meetings, um, we had um, a meeting about integrating some software to make our program more efficient. We did that with Fire Safe Council um, staff. Uh, that's called Fireside. So we're looking at reaching back to the software developer to see how it can better meet the needs of our program. Uh, Victoria will talk later uh, in her presentation. We had some uh, Stop the Bleed training, which very well attended that we did in collaboration with Los Altos, uh, the city of Los Altos CERT program. We have upcoming um, a youth commission meeting that we were supposed to attend last year, but it was canceled because of COVID. 
we had a planning meeting this last month and then we have that meeting coming up um, on Sunday, March 7th. Uh, so that's, that's right around the corner. Uh, again, we've already talked about the parcel walk uh, that we did to, to talk about uh, improvements on the parcel and to make that uh, utilities that are on site and the needs of the parcel uh, for safety and access to be um, completed. There was a faith-based neighborhood meeting, um, and that's again, trying to collaborate with our faith-based organizations and what their capacities and how they would fill in the event of an emergency. Um, and that was kind of a goals and, and moving, we initially started with faith-based preparedness conversations, and now we're moving into being a little bit more proactive to see what type of involvement and what capacities they would have in that. We've already mentioned the, the Lynx project, the GIS Lynx project. Um, and we did some Zoom technology training. Since we've had to do this pivot and it's been extended, we were finding out a little bit of what we could do additionally with Zoom, uh, some of the options. And we're gonna move forward and getting a little extra training on that. We've already discussed the Hydrant Task Force and that was very effective to get some information to really manage our assets uh, and really uh, look at how we can best uh, communicate uh, with the partners and the stakeholders. <coughs> so we have a few upcoming meetings. I have a Fire Safe Council shaded fuel break meetings in process. Uh, that's ongoing with uh, different staff members, Fire Safe Council, and I'm also meeting with County Fire. Initially, I'm meeting with El Monte Station, uh, meeting with B-Shift tomorrow with the battalion chief and the captain to just kind of find out what things keep them most concerned, uh, where we can maybe focus some of our vegetation management on a company level. Uh, I will meet with all three shifts, and eventually I know County Fire's in the process of hiring a battalion chief that will be in charge of wildland. And that will probably be my point of contact moving forward. But I kind of wanted to get the, the lowest level uh, people that respond, boots on the ground, find out what keeps them awake at night around vegetation management. So those meetings are ongoing. Uh, we have an evacuation workshop coming up. That date is determined. It's actually a week from tonight. Uh, it's next Tuesday. And that is uh, to be very much similar to the one that we did in Saddle Mountain. Um, and then we'll discuss if we want to do an evacuation drill. The hope is to eventually encourage them to become also a FireWise community. It's kind of a stepping stone for us, along with other communities that I'm currently uh, speaking with and trying to organize. And then we also have the FireWise community certification. Right now, Saddle Mountain is the only um, community that we have in a process of that right now. It's a, about an eight-step process that we go through and we help support with the help of Fire Safe Council. Next slide. Captain Bowden has hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I have that reduced down. Yes, go ahead, please. So I just wanted to recognize there's one thing that Captain Gluhan left off on her list and, and I really just wanted to, um, to, to, to call it out because it's incredibly important to me. Um, Captain Gluhan was a, a critical part of our critical incident stress management team um, when she was a captain here at County Fire. And we, we had a pretty significant loss in the county um, the last couple of weeks. And I just really want to thank you, Denise, for stepping in and participating and, and helping a lot of really struggling folks through that difficult time. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, Chief Bowden, for your kind words. It was, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an honor to be able to, uh, to give back at some level to peer support. So with my voice a little scratchy, I will uh, pass it on to uh, Victoria, if you could finish up the, the CERT portion of this. Thank you. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, President Warren, commissioners, uh, staff, public, and support personnel, um, and welcome to the new um, commissioners. Um, my reports. Um, sorry, you guys, I got a little bit of altitude uh, poisoning going on. I'm in Colorado, and I just got in here, so... Hopefully it makes sense tonight. A um, couple of pictures just to point out. I think Denise talked about Stop the Bleed. Um, a lot of our um, training has actually been uh, well attended. This one was over 102 people, I believe, we had at this training, which is uh, double what we usually have. Um, so I'm really, really glad that our collaborative efforts with Los Altos um, are coming to fruition with um, trying to get more people to our trainings. Um, we also are working with the um, county's uh, CERT program managers as well to push out a lot of this education. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, Sarah, I can explain it more here. 
Um, so before I get into um, some other things, um, I have Dave Stewart here and we did our CERT survey, survey and he wants to talk about some of the results and um, what we're doing with this survey before he um, goes over the survey results quickly um, is we're taking this and we're doing a lot of our training and um, some of our projects. Uh, we're taking a lot of these things that were brought up in the survey and we're addressing them and identifying some, some of the things. Some of the things we've already identified prior to the survey, but it's always very helpful to do forward uh, planning for the year. So take it away, Dave. Okay. Uh, can we pull up the first set of slides here? Basically, what we've been doing for the last, uh, this year and, and last, were to do sort of an engagement survey and figure out what was going on with the certs, particularly after the uh, uh, long drought in between of uh, uh, not having the same kind of engagement. So uh, we asked some pretty standardized questions of, you know, how involved are you? And I just want to race through these. If anyone uh, has questions, you know, feel free to slow them down, but Otherwise, I think we'll just run through these about as quick as we can. Next slide, please. So the first and most important question is always, are you going to continue? Uh, you'll see that we have a 97% participation uh, continuing. And the one person who decided that they weren't going to continue, uh, I don't think I want to name her, but she has you know, decided that she's uh, uh, retiring from several uh, of fire district opportunities. So excellent, we're, we're keeping everybody on board. Um, this slide is about how we did. We had 42% think that we improved over last year. And I asked a uh, sort of weird question here where I said, stayed about the same, which is good, or stayed about the same, which is disappointing. And that's the red uh, piece there for 39% who felt that we were doing a good job last year. We've done that. So you see that the, uh, Overall here is very positive, about two thirds. 9% felt it got worse. And the other three uh, tiny little slivers there are mostly complaining about Zoom meetings, which we can't do a lot about. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> this was just a simple question to see how people wanted to get their information. Email is clearly the dominant winner here. Um, the uh, thing that Victoria has done, which didn't happen until after this question got asked, was to actually make an exportable calendar that you can import into uh, whatever you use as a local calendar. But uh, well, we continue to send people email to let them know what's going on. Next slide. Uh, these were sort of too much, too little questions. And we had about the right amount of information and it was mostly good information. You see, we had uh, some of these people not really answer the questions. We only had seven responses on good. So maybe that means that we need to be a little more careful with what we're doing. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> we seem to be having certainly enough meetings. We had about right for 62% and uh, there were too many or way too many uh, was another 25, almost 30%. So we're thinking about actually uh, figuring out ways to uh, sort the meetings into better bins so that there are introductory meetings, uh, extension meetings and trainings, and then um, really sort of social meetings and people can attend as they want. Next slide. Uh, this is very busy and I apologize, but we were trying to uh, get a sense of what was going on with the meeting quality. Um, by and large, people are pretty happy. They're generally useful uh, and they help with the sense of community. Victoria did a lot with trying to um, actually kind of pull people together during the early days of the COVID stuff and make sure that uh, uh, they felt engaged. So we don't have a lot of too long. We don't have a lot of too short. Um, the kind of complaints that we got were the sort of usual complaints you have about meetings. They run long, they're a little unfocused. Uh, we're gonna see what we can do to tighten up the meetings and try to keep them a little bit tighter on track. Next slide. Um, people felt we had about the right number of training meetings, although a few more would never hurt. You see that uh, we had 19% of uh, uh, 
too few. So clearly, the more training meetings we can do, and the more training information we provide to people, the better off we're going to be. Next slide. Uh, this is just a little bit more breakdown. Again, we got a lot of generally useful and valuable. Um, we had one person say they were too long, where most people said they were about right. Uh, the reason why this doesn't all come up to 100% here is that it's a multiple choice sort of thing, and we can check uh, different answers. And some people just left a lot of uh, bits blank. Um, <clears throat> There's a one question. We also had some uh, uh, fill in the blank at the bottom of these things. And I thought this was a particularly interesting uh, comment, which is there are never more than 20 people. I have photos of when we had over 300. We are far behind what is required. The town uses CERT on silly tasks and dog work with free access to people's car. Any leadership from the town on CERT, elected or professional staff is absent. Victoria is doing her best, but is only part-time. I know that we've uh, upped Victoria to full-time, but I think this is a, a comment that I like because I share is that, uh, you know, while I really appreciate the support of the fire district, I feel like the town kind of uh, ignores us. Next slide. Uh, this was a question of what do you want to do? What do you want to help with? Uh, so I took the top several answers here. Um, a lot of people are interested in the ARC refresh. Uh, people want to show off as a group and march in a CERT group in the 4th of July parade as opposed to doing the uh, dog work of uh, blocking the roads. Uh, we had some interest in staffing information booth at the town picnic, organizing network neighborhoods, recruiting at the town picnic and help with the festival lights. And I'll just point out that we had, uh, I think six or seven LAH certs and one Los Altos cert who helped with the festival lights uh, last year. Next slide. Oh, okay, that was the last slide. Take any questions? No questions. I just want to say, though, that uh, I attended a couple of the CERT training classes because actually Zoom made it easier for me to attend, and both were really useful uh, uses of the time. So I really appreciate the amount of planning this puts to put to put these together, and I think it's great. So I appreciate all the effort that, that everyone put into making those happen. I know it's combined with Los Altos and others as well, but uh, I find them really helpful and, and really uh, innervating as well. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think it's one of the few things we can continue to do on Zoom is to manage these trainings and it does keep people involved. Okay, Victoria, back to you. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for taking the time to put together this survey. It takes a very long time and then to go through all the results. So thank you very much. We'll have an update at our next meeting on kind of what we're doing to address some of the things that were brought up in the survey. Um, just really quickly, uh, monthly meetings, um, our CCT, uh, CCLT program manager meetings, um, we're starting to um, put together some definitive um, uh, missions and, and objectives, which we typically uh, were not doing. Um, this is where all the program managers from the county, uh, we meet once a um, month and I um, have offered to be the chair. So I'll have some uh, better updates at our next um, meeting where we're going to solidify some things. Um, just want to point out some of our additional needs and activities we've done. I think Denise um, talked about the Youth Commission, um, the conference that they're having. Um, also, we are trying to start a teen CERT program. I have a, um, a couple of teens that are interested in, in moving that uh, program along. I've talked to the town a little bit about it. We're going to be putting together a proposal and giving it to the town. Um, we're going to be at the conference talking about the Teen Start program and seeing um, what kind of interest we have. Um, I'm happy to say we, at this point, with just very basic knowledge of what we're doing, we've got about 25 kids that have already shown interest in wanting to just do the program. So I think that's really going to help us with our recruiting um, aspect. Um, also, too, um, uh, we have an upcoming uh, search and rescue um, real life scenario and case study with um, our very own Terry and Mari Kearney. 
um, uh, on Thursday night. So if you can join us, uh, please do. Really looking forward to that. Um, I think that's pretty much it for me. I think everyone else has covered the other other aspects of my report. Is there, I think that's that's the end of it, right, Sarah? Oh no, I've got, there it is. Okay, sorry. Yes, I already covered the other things on that. So thank you very much and a report for me. Very good. Thank, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, EMS coordinator, uh, emergency services manager, Gluhan and CERT program analyst, BB. Is there any discussion from the commission? None. Is there any public comment on this item? Hearing none, we'll now move to item nine, which is the integrated hazardous fuel reduction programs update. Item 9A is the update emergency services manager, Captain Gluhan. Please, please introduce the item. So for this item, oops, sorry, I'm, I am off it. Okay. So yep. again, um, this is, uh, and General Manager Loken uh, mentioned some of the extra, um, the why behind this, uh, what we're doing. So we're continuing, uh, and thank you again for, uh, ratifying the budget, the draft budget last month, because that gives us um, gives us some place to, to, to take the money and do programs with that. So we're looking at uh, the defensible space brush chipping, which we've continued to do. Again, we mentioned we're looking at ways that that can be more efficient. Uh, we almost have a year coming up in April to have a measurement metric to see kind of what's going on. We also want to use our GIS to collaborate the information in to see where we maybe need to focus more vegetation management, where chipping isn't going on by at the residential level. Again, I already had mentioned that we uh, many times in past meetings, we have the home ignition zone inspections. Those were on hold because of COVID. Um, Fire Safe Council is going through training and working out their policies around uh, their public interaction so that they can uh, restart the HIZs. And then um, a lot of what they're helping me with also is again, the shaded fuel break planning. And these are really around evacuation routes. And again, tying in the individual um, activities of the residents into the town programs and into our fire district programs to reduce vegetation and uh, improve egress and access into the roads and infrastructure into our community. And I think that, oh, and I, the, the key point on the new uh, legislation with, um, and, it's, and we have been focusing in our meetings, our wildland evacuation workshop is the new zone in the, measure, in the defensible space is that zero to five feet. So the big push is really to remove all vegetation, all combustible products in that zero to five feet around the home. So that'll be where our major messaging will be moving forward. Uh, Fire Safe Council is developing more worksheets and information sheets on that also, but that is one of the focus areas because people have heard about the 30 and the 100 you know, in the zero to five is really where the fire science is showing the fires start. So that's the end of my report. Great. Thank you, uh, Emergency Services Manager Gluhan. Is there any discussion from the commission? Is there any public comment? All right, we'll now move to item 10, personnel report. All right. Item 10A is the First Amendment to the District Clerk Employment Agreement. General Manager Logan, please introduce the item. Uh, thank you, President Warren. The First Amendment will extend the District Clerk part-time position. The details are summarized in the text of the agenda item and then also in the First Amendment that is attached. And the First Amendment has re been reviewed for form and legality by Assistant County Counsel Rob Quello. So I recommend that the commission approve this extension for the district clerk, the part-time position. Thank you, end of my report. Thank you, Man uh, General Manager Logan. Are there any clarifying questions from the commission on item 10A, uh, on 10A? All right, hearing none, I will now entertain a motion for item 10A. Come on, someone's got to do it. Do I, do I move to approve today? Spring, move to <coughs> spring seconds. So it was that Joan, you jumped that, in there? That was Joan. Correct. That was Joan. All right. So Joan moved. 
And Roger seconded for to approve item 10A. All right, the item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commissioners? Is there any public comment on this item? Hearing none, if there's no further discussion, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call vote. All right, thank you. Uh, President Warren. An emphatic yes. Vice President Vaughn. Yes. Commissioner Kearney. Yes. Commissioner Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. And Commissioner Tyson. Another emphatic yes. Thank you. And the motion passes seven to zero. Great. Thank you for District Clerk Vargas. We'll now move to item 11, financial consultant report just, uh, and district clerk report. Items 11A and C are the reports. District Clerk Vargas, change your hat now and give us the, um, uh, please provide the financial reports. All right, thank you very much. And just to explain to the, the new commissioners, I, I wear sort of a dual role. Um, I'm an employee as a clerk and I am a consultant, uh, their financial consultant, which I've been in this, that position a little more than 10 years now. So um, I, it, might get confusing sometimes, you don't know who you're talking to, and I, I do wish I had a little hat. Um, but let's really, really quickly go through. Um, so item 11A, which is on screen, that is what is uh, presented as our final draft budget um, to the County of Santa Clara Office of Budget and Analysis. Um, it's then taken to the County Executive for review, um, and then ultimately sent to the Board of Supervisors for final approval. Um, so tonight we're going to ask um, just that the uh, commission uh, sort of make a, a motion um, and final approval for that final draft, um, or if there's any last minute changes that need to be made, um, then you can approve it with the corrections and I will send that tomorrow to uh, the Office of Budget and Analysis. Um, I, uh, item B is the uh, draft one of the budget narrative. And, and really tonight, because um, I, I know we're crunched for time, it would be great just if you kind of take that and really take uh, through to next month's meeting to review it, to uh, let me know if there's any corrections or questions, if anything's not clear. I am not offended if you think that I've written something horribly because numbers are my thing, not words. So um, especially the um, two new commissioners um, would appreciate kind of looking from the outside in almost as a member of the public to, to if, if something just does not make any sense to you at all, um, then I can find a way to maybe explain it better because um, you're looking at it with fresh eyes. So um, really that's, that's my request for tonight is that you kind of take this whole month to read it over. And um, this doesn't have a timeline that it needs to be submitted to the county. So um, it's just as long as I can get it posted online to the public before the fiscal year 22 starts. Um, so that is that one. And then uh, 11C is um, just a reminder um, to commissioners and staff um, to file your form 700. You should have all received an email from me, um, those who are applicable to be filing the form 700. So I'm not sure if there's anybody who did not receive it, if you could just please send me an email. And I think you all have my email clerk at lahcfd.org. And that is the end of my report on that. Um, and I do recommend, um, unless of course you have any revisions for 11A, I recommend uh, you vote to approve. Thank you. All right, so the item on the floor, or the request here is, is that we need a motion to, pat, um, to receive and approve um, items 11A and B, correct? No, just, just 11A. Just 11A, yeah, okay. Yeah. This is what's sent to county. Um, then my request is just to review 11B thoroughly. Okay, so we need a motion to approve 11A, which is the draft budget. So moved. Can I just chime in, President Warren? Yes. Just, if we can, if the motion could just follow the language in the agenda uh, to receive the final draft budget submitted to the right. My so, understanding is that it's already been submitted. Is that correct? 
That is correct. Yes, um, I'll, I have been told by uh, the Office of Budget Analysis, though, that if she's going to give us kind of a little leeway, if there were any changes made at tonight's meeting, um, she will approve them as long as I can get it submitted to her by tomorrow. Okay. Okay. So, so thank you. Um, so I need a motion to approve 11A, receive the FY 2021-2022 Final draft budget submitted to County of Santa Clara Office of Budget and Analysis, OBA, on February 12th, 2021. So I need a first and a second on as read. As part of the budget subcommittee, a Spring is happy to move approval. We need a second, please. Kearney seconds. Thank you. All right. The item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Hearing none. Is there any public comment on this item? All right, hearing none, if there's no further discussion, we'll now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please call the roll call vote. Thank you. President Warren. Approve. Uh, Vice President Vaughn. Approve. Commissioner Kearney. Approved. Commissioner Sherlock. Approved. Commissioner Spreen. Approved. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. And Commissioner Tyson. Approved. Great. And the motion passes seven to zero. Great. Okay, before we move to item 12, uh, Commissioner Kearney, I understand it's been a really long day for you and you would like to take your leave of us at this time. So um, have a good okay. night, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to take uh, my leave, um, but I really have to. It's been a very long day, so on another long day tomorrow. So thanks all and welcome to the new commissioners. Thanks to the uh, members of the public that have uh, hung in there and, and to, the, uh, to the other participants. Great. Thanks. District Clerk Vargas, please note that Commissioner Kearney has left the meeting. Noted. All right, we will now move to item 12, commission overview and orientation. Item 12 will be presented by the various speakers. General Manager Logan, please introduce the item. Uh, thank you, uh, Board President Warren. Uh, the Commission Overview and Orientation is an introduction for new commissioners and a re refresher for ongoing commissioners. This is a two-part series tonight. And tonight we focus on governance and the various related topics listed in agenda item 12. Next month, March 16th, the Commission will focus on the district's partnership with Santa Clara County Central Fire Protection District and fire services provided to the community. In addition, there will be a presentation by Friar and Loretta, the district consulting engineer, engineers, to, dis, to explain the district's water system to support fire suppression. The water system is composed of 540 district-owned hydrants and the related infrastructure. Management Resource Group Consultant Marcy Scott will lead off the presentation tonight. For benefit of the new commissioners, Marcy Scott facilitated the development, approval, and now the implementation of the district's 21-22 strategic plan. After Ms. Scott's presentation, then MRG Consultant Shirley Concalino, who will speak on records management, and she will be followed by Lead Deputy County Counsel Tris. Chris Chelladen to speak about related legal aspects of governance. So Marcy Scott, I'm very pleased to turn the uh, orientation and introduction session over to you. Terrific. Thank you so much, General Manager Logan. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to all the commissioners and the two new commissioners that I am meeting tonight. Um, nice to see you. As uh, General Manager Logan mentioned, I've been working on projects um, as needed, specifically the strategic plan project. And um, that is a good example to use tonight as we talk about governance. There's a wide and deep breadth of experience at the virtual dais, I suppose we call it now. Um, and this presentation will review the fundamentals around the role of district commissioner and how to best utilize the skills, knowledge, and abilities of the commission. Next slide. The uh, district is what's considered a dependent district of the county and is currently in its 82nd year. The district exists to 
protect um, people, property, and the environment from disasters and other emergencies, and provides programs for education, prevention, protection, and as well as uh, emergency response services. And finally, commissioners are financial stewards of public funds. So this is the purpose of the district. Next slide. We use this visual um, to help demonstrate how the, um, how the mission is supported. And um, we consider three pillars are most important in um, supporting the district's mission. The strategic plan 2021-22, which was adopted in January, is now moving forward. Um, the annual budget, we just heard a presentation about that. And um, as a dependent district, the Board of Supervisors approves the budget. And the budget cycle, as you've probably noted, operates a little differently than municipal government. Um, and we have some folks who are experienced in working with the municipalities here locally. Um, and generally the budget process doesn't start until around April or May. <clears throat> but here to um, be incorporated into the county's budget process, it's a little bit um, sooner. Um, and finally, um, the third pillar is the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. This provides the latest fire science knowledge. Um, you'll also note that it's considered Annex 4. And the Community Wildfire Protection Plan is a countywide um, plan and it's split into annexes. Annex 4 represents the district and this area. And um, this document informs district programs and materials. Next slide. <clears throat> First and foremost, commissioners support the mission of the district. Um, and commissioners do this through setting the vision, uh, specifically through the strategic goals and objectives. Um, and uh, commissioners oversee the use of public tax monies in, dil in a diligent manner that is consistent with county guidelines. And commissioners represent residents and the public you may run into residents in the grocery or out on the pathways and um, you answer their questions, you engage them and you receive input. And that's, that's very helpful. Um, those interactions while today are somewhat limited, we hope in the near future we'll be back to being able to interact um, uh, in an easier capacity. Um, and last but not least, um, commissioners connect with and build bridges with other agencies and stakeholders. Next slide, please. So as we've discussed, the commission provides vision and strategic direction, um, but the role of staff is to figure out how to implement and make recommendations for commission consideration. Staff provides analysis and identifies impacts. Uh, staff establishes best practices, ascribes to continuous improvement, and staff coordinates with central fire, utilities, town and cities, and other regional partners. Um, and staff communicates frequently with commissioners to keep them informed and links communication throughout the community through the website and social media. Also, staff has expertise and serve as subject matter experts. They are dedicated to public service and they sustain district operations. And I also want to note that the staff at the district are highly responsive. Sometimes, many times are proactive and sometimes are reactive. Um, with emergencies, we often can't see them coming, although we do have a recent e example of an opportunity to be proactive. And that was with the recent wind event. Um, when the district staff learned of that event, they immediately spun into action to start sending out notifications and to help prepare residents to be prepared for potential power shutoffs. So in this way, the district um, staff often has to pivot quickly. 
Okay, next staff, uh, next, uh, excuse me, next slide. Um, this is an infographic that the district staff have created that help demonstrate how programs are organized. And this helps you give, uh, uh, helps to give a visual sense of really how the district achieves its mission. On the left-hand side, that group of programs are known as prevention and protection programs. That includes CERT, um, amateur radio, evacuation drills, many of those things we heard about tonight. On the right-hand side is the integrated hazardous fuel reduction programs. And uh, these are programs such as the home inspections, the chipping, um, et cetera. And up at the top, the, the commissioners oversee and help um, to provide the vision. And then the staff, which is um, described down at the bottom, um, do all the day-to-day -day work in terms of creating and operating these programs. Um, now with commissioners aligned with the strategic goals, work plans will advance each of the strategic goals and likely will influence this chart. We call this a living chart because it will continue to evolve and change. Okay, next slide. So how do commissioners succeed in their role? Um, by absorbing information and listening to the public and to experts, um, by understanding fire science, which is evolving, we must keep up with increasing knowledge. Um, a good example of that was uh, back in October of 27, uh, 2017, uh, the Tubbs fire burned through Santa Rosa. And that was a really devastating event. Uh, many lives were lost. It was only a few months later in December of 2017 that the Thomas fire ripped through Ventura County. And even in that short period of time, there was learning about evacuations and where things fell flat. Um, and there was a much better execution in December um, during the Thomas fire. And so we will continue to learn as we go through these events um, and we need to apply uh, that knowledge. Um, supporting community resiliency is complex and there's no set formula. Um, emergencies strike without regard to your address or really any characteristic. Um, we've seen that with COVID, we've seen that with uh, um, earthquakes and certainly with wildfire. Uh, many organizations are involved and work toward our goals of community resiliency together. Uh, the regional approach is critical to maximizing resources, talent, and effort. Next slide. This is a, a pretty simple view of how uh, the district works with some of our other stakeholders and neighbors. Um, you will see that there are different sizes and types of organizations in this chart and the missions of these agencies vary. Some are very broad. For example, the county has an incredibly large scope of services that it delivers every day and municipal agencies do as well. Um, whereas the nonprofits and the district have a more narrow scope and a more specific mission. Um, and uh, we heard earlier Chief Bowden commented on working together um, with the district as um, we go through the Board of Supervisors and their committees. Um, there also will be two studies sponsored by the county, one by LAFCO and one by the county moving forward. And this partnership and close collaboration is really critical. Um, also, this has been a theme in the new strategic plan, um, this regional approach to service and um, one way it's characterized is that the district has been helpful in filling in gaps along the way. For example, um, the district provides an OK card, which is um, an eight and a half by 11 sheet in green that says very in very large letters, OK. It's available on the website. 
It's available for residents. And in the event of an earthquake, for example, a, a resident can put that sign out on their fence um, or in their mailbox if everything is fine in their household. And then public safety officers can move on and devote their resources to those who are in urgent need of service. So that's a, a, an efficiency measure. Um, next slide, please. So to meet the district's mission, um, the district with its, its fairly focused scope uses expertise, the CERT program, amateur radio, volunteers, consultants, regional partners to help the community prepare for emergencies and respond to emergencies. Um, General Manager Logan recently presented at town council and discussed this principle of role discipline, um, where working within the role and the mission of the organization is critical to avoid duplication of effort and inefficiencies. And that allows us to all work together toward a, a common goal and together. Okay, next slide. Um, so in summary, the commission deliberates and defines strategic goals and the vision. Um, commissioners also build bridges and form relationships. Commissioners are key to synchronizing with other agencies and the staff manages day-to-day -day activities to meet the strategic direction from the commission. Um, and then the next slide, uh, we have a variety of references and resources available to commissioners. Uh, the first is the district overview and orientation. Um, two handbooks have been provided. One is specific to the County of Santa Clara. The other is um, a statewide handbook for special districts. And both of those are really helpful. Um, the district provides the resources of the strategic plan, the budget, the Annex 4. Um, those are documents that speak directly and inform the district's programs. Also, I'd like to point out that under CWPP Annex 4, it also mentions the addendum. This is a tool that's been created by district staff to um, put the more technical parts of the CWPP into regular layperson's language for residents to better understand what those documents mean and how that can inform our actions. And um, finally, the district staff and county council are well equipped to respond to questions you may have um, during your term on, on the commission. And the last slide, that concludes uh, this governance overview. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Okay, there we go. Actually, I do have a question, um, Marcy. So um, thank you very much for that overview. That really helps put things in perspective and I will make sure I do follow on all those documents that I haven't read so far. Um, for the strategic plan, where do I see a schedule of how we implement the actual activities around it? Is that somewhere also? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Sherlock. Um, the, the strategic plan work plan is going to start rolling out now with the um, commission's action tonight in item four. We have now aligned commissioners with each strategic goal and um, each commissioner will be working with staff to start the process of developing a work plan and a timeline and next steps. And um, we anticipate that there will be some community meetings um, to have discussion about those specific strategic, uh, strategic goals and next steps. So in short, it's a coming attraction and it will the development of that specific work plan and the timelines for those steps for each of those goals will begin um, very quickly here. And we get to work closely with staff, which is great. So yes, um, absolutely, as well as with Central Fire and all the various stakeholders. And each goal is unique, um, and there'll be a different work plan for each goal, um, as well as a little bit of overlap. 
the CWPP will inform um, many of the goals. So it'll be important that um, commissioners also communicate um, with colleagues through this process. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anything else? Okay, very good. Well, um, I would like to then hand over the microphone to Shirley Concolino, and she's here um, as a subject matter expert to talk about records management and give commissioners an overview on that important topic. Well, thank you, Marcy. Good evening, commissioners and President Warren. Um, my name is Shirley Concolino. I recently joined this team to review the records management component of the district. My background most relevant to this project is that I served as the city clerk for the city of Sacramento for 15 years before retiring three years ago. And during that tenure, I led a team for process improvement and re-engineering that embraced technology all along the way. And one of the biggest components of that was the successful implementation of a very robust records management system with public access to most all of the city's public records. And in fact, most of our legislative documents, actually all of our legislative documents, uh, all the way back to 1921 are available on the website with a, a very robust search engine. So I am happy to be working with you on your records management program. I've had preliminary conversations with Corey and Sarah and general manager Logan um, to start this project. So I know that they are committed to implementing best pra practices for records management. And we will start by assessing the existing records, um, reviewing the retention schedule, which you have and is uh, recently adopted, uh, digitize any uh, stored declared records, um, create naming conventions, and then identify methodologies for backing up existing records. And then ultimately we'll recommend a technology solution for compliance and uh, public access to the public records via the web. So it is an interesting project. This is a topic that I absolutely am passionate about and it serves our communities well and our constituents well. And in the end, everyone is better served. So of course we will better or we will continue to work with the clerk of the board of supervisors and the county council as we move forward. Um, this is a very high level overview of where we are going. It's just in its beginning stages and there will be further reports to you as the progress continues. Um, but this concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I guess there are none. <laughs> None. I'll just I'll just say one thing. I mean, we're coming a long way from the fact that only a year or two ago we had everything in a file cabinet in the closet of the uh, fire station. So you know we we've really been moving rapidly to being a modern organization the way we should. So I I thank you for taking us to the next level. Absolutely, I understand most of your records are already digitized, so that made me very happy. That's a very good start. Yeah, and Corey's had to bear the brunt of sort of of yes. everything being swamped and digital without being organized. So I know it's a big project and uh, I don't take it lightly and I appreciate your, again, setting us up to be a real modern organization. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I think at this point now we can uh, turn the microphone over to Chris Chelladen and he will give us the legal parameters around governance. So <laughs> you're there. Uh, hi, everyone. For the new commissioners, uh, my name is Chris Sheldon. I've been representing the district for about four or five months. Um, I've been with the county council's office in this county for seven years, um, worked primarily in the, in the public works contracts and real estate area. My background is in um, land use uh, matters and been practicing law for about 25 years. Um, Really happy to be representing the district. Uh, been, it's been really a great experience getting up to speed over the last few months. Um, Jay asked me to cover what I would consider to be sort of the fundamental issues of public law. And I would also mention that uh, President Warren is shooting for us to be 
close to being done by 9 p.m. I had around 35 minutes of uh, a presentation to give, so we're pretty much on schedule. I'll try to be pretty close to nine o'clock or maybe a little bit after uh, to allow some time for questions. And so essentially the three topics, of the three topics, I'll speak for the bulk of the time about the Brown Act um, and probably around 15 minutes with time for questions and then conflicts for maybe 10 minutes and then CPRA uh, for five minutes and then time for questions afterwards. And the reason I mention that is just because the, uh, the conflicts issues are very hard to cover in a brief period. Also commissioners and uh, elected officials uh, generally are required to take conflict of interest training every two years under uh, state law. Uh, so that's covered in other uh, areas. I sometimes give that training as well. And then the, the Public Records Act questions will be relatively brief, uh, or I'm sorry, Public Records Act information will be relatively brief, uh, maybe around um, five minutes. And I would mention too that I'm using County Council's um, sort of uh, most up-to-date standard slides on these topics. We try to give consistent presentations to all of our different clients, but I would note that I left all of the slides in the presentations and I'm not gonna have time to cover every slide in detail, but I did provide the slides so that people could use them as a reference point um, going forward. If they have questions, you know, that, that it'll, it'll be available in the public record. And, and also many of you are very experienced in these topics. So to the extent um, you wanna chime in with questions or comments, as long as we roughly stick to the 30 or 35 minutes, I've found that that can make things more interesting for, for people I also maybe have people that aren't very familiar with these topics either. And so we're trying to create a baseline of, of knowledge and information. So um, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. I guess I would first ask too, if anyone has any introductory comments or questions before I get going here. So the Brown Act, I like to say is, um, you know, intended to sort of stop the governmental decision-making process from being uh, done in the sort of smoke-filled back room where the decisions are not made in public. I find it interesting that the Brown Act was enacted in 1954, so it's actually a very old law in the government code in California. Um, the idea here is, is exactly what this says, is that the goal is for decisions of government bodies to be transparent um, and that the public can participate and observe governmental decision-making processes. However, there is also a, a competing interest, such as that we want government decision-making processes to be effective and to be as um, uh, sophisticated and high level as possible. So in addition to the government uh, decision we made in person, there's also an interest in government uh, staff and others to be able to speak candidly internally and to have some level of confidentiality to help shape those recommendations uh, that are brought to the board. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so this is the sort of fundamental rule of the Brown Act, which is that a majority of the members of, the, of a legislative body, and I should note that your commission is a legislative body subject to the Brown Act, shall not outside an authorized meeting, which is what we're conducting now, use a series of communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or take action on an item of uh, interest that is within the subject matter of the body. And the important thing on this slide is that idea of a majority of members. And so at the Board of Supervisors level, we call it the rule of two, which means that there are five supervisors and a quorum or a majority of the member would be three members. So typically a board member would only speak to one other board member on a particular item. Here we have seven commissioners for this meeting, for this body, therefore the a quorum would be four members. So typically the Brown Act would not be implicated if one, commissioner speaks to only uh, two other commissioners for a total of three, that would be less than a legislative body. Not that I necessarily recommend talking to other commissioners on every item, but in terms of, of commissioners speaking to uh, several commissioners about an item outside of a pu notice public hearing, it's important to be aware of that, um, of that rule of really don't wanna be speaking to more than two other commissioners as an individual commissioner. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so Brown Act, what it, what it applies to for purposes of, of the um, uh, this commission, obviously the fire district is a special district created by state law. The, for those uh, new commissioners, uh, it bears repeating that the district's board of directors is the uh, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. 
Um, however, in roughly 1980, the Board of Supervisors delegated substantial authority and powers to this commission. And, um, and with very limited exceptions, the, the business of the commission is general, I'm sorry, the business of the district is generally done by this commission. And this commission is a legisl legislative body subject to regulation under the Brown Act because as we'll get to in the next slide, it was created by formal action of the Board of Supervisors. Um, and um, so we also have, uh, so generally it, re it regulates the commission and the commission's meetings. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so essentially, as I just said, uh, the governing body of this agency is the Board of Supervisors acting as the Board of Directors. However, um, this commission was created by formal action of the um, Board of Supervisors. Therefore, this commission is a legislative body. And then interestingly, President Warren asked me to emphasize that your commission at times will create subsidiary bodies. And in general, those subsidiary bodies created by formal action of your commission are also subject to the Brown Act. Um, and in an example would be, for example, uh, we have a standing committee, uh, budget committee. My understanding is it's a standing committee. It, it deals with the budget every year. If I'm incorrect on that, uh, you can let me know. But that is itself, for purposes of this discussion, a standing committee of this commission. And therefore, it is a Brown Act body subject to uh, the normal notice and meeting requirements of the Brown Act. On the other hand, the Brown Act allows temporary, what are called temporary ad hoc uh, subcommittees of legislative bodies. And, and those essentially are less than a quorum of this commission, have to be made up only by members of this commission. And then that temporary committee has to have a specific purpose and generally is of a limited time frame or duration. So for example, having a budget committee that reviews the budget every year would be a standing committee. Uh, having this commission appoint two or three commissioners to study a particular issue. Uh, for example, um, it might be studying um, contemplated fire station uh, renovations uh, with a report back to uh, this, com this commit commission would be an example of a temporary ad hoc committee and, and the point is that the temporary ad hoc committee needs to be a little more flexible, needs to be able to meet uh, without having to comply with all the formal rules of the Brown Act. Um, and uh, I haven't created, or this, this commission hasn't created a temporary ad hoc committee since I've been here to my knowledge, uh, but maybe it may be necessary to do that in the future. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is sort of the heart of the, of the Brown Act training. Uh, which is that the Brown Act defines meeting very broadly, and it includes any gathering of the majority of the members to hear, discuss, deliberate, or take action of any item within the legislative body's subject matter jurisdiction. I would just highlight, because I get this question a lot in giving Brown Act training, people will say, well, we're just having a study session. There's nothing on the agenda where the commission or, or the body, the Brown Act body is taking action. And I would just note that under the Brown Act, no vote or action is required for it to still be a meeting subject to the Brown Act. And then similarly, any gathering where a majority of the members even just receive information or hear a proposal or discuss their views is also within the subject matter jurisdiction of a meeting subject to the notice uh, and open meeting requirements of the Brown Act. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, meetings obviously include, uh, we're in a meeting now, it's a noticed and agendized uh, meeting, uh, but that would include uh, meetings that aren't agendized that involve face-to-face -face meetings of a, of a uh, majority of the commission would also be considered potentially prohibited Brown Act meetings if they were unnoticed. So this would be your meeting at a local coffee shop or restaurant. Uh, video teleconferencing, um, this is sort of pre-COVID. Uh, this would be you know, having a meeting through use of technology or intermediaries. And then the more interesting one uh, for people that maybe aren't as familiar with the Brown Act and the more sort of complex con concept is maybe having what's called a serial meeting. And that means that the meeting is not uh, contemporaneous like this meeting. This might be a meeting that is going on over several days and could include a series of communications. The, you know, the best example would be a series of meetings perhaps where uh, one board member is meeting with individual board members and then using the information that the board member is getting from other board members and giving that information to other board members and or using that information to shape their own views on a particular item. Um, not that any of us would expect to do that, but that's uh, a potential issue. And then really the, the, 
sort of more common thing would, and this could be also inadvertent, would be ongoing email exchanges about matters of, of district business where board members might be replying to all giving their opinion on a particular matter. Uh, and based on that email chain, even if it's occurring over a period of time, could be a potential issue with regard to Brown Act compliance. So for example, let's say that um, uh, General Manager Logan or someone sends an email to the entire commission about uh, an informational item uh, involving uh, commission business and a, a board member might say, well, you know, why are we doing it that way? We should be doing it a different way. Uh, and then another board member potentially chimes in and, and pretty soon you have the issue of, of a majority or a quorum of the board sort of um, in a, unofficially deliberating on an item in front of the um, in front of the commission. So some of the things that we do to try to mitigate that risk is number one, sometimes uh, staff will send emails to individual commissioners. They might send it to the whole commission, but they will send each separate emails to the individual commission. Or if we send it to everyone, we might put in all caps at the end of the email, please do not reply all to this email. One thing I would mention is I don't want to give the impression that staff can't communicate with board members. Um, the law does allow, for example, uh, uh, General Manager Logan or myself to write an email or to even have individual meetings with board members to convey information to the commission. That's completely fine. The issue would become whether we, where staff or a board member were using information gained in that meeting uh, to sort of do what's called a collective concurrence uh, and use that information to provide it to other board members to sort of shape a decision uh, outside the scope of, a, of an actual meeting. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna cover this slide under CPRA. So if we go to the next slide. Um, one thing that's new for those of you who uh, maybe haven't had a Brown Act training in a while, I, I find it really interesting. It was just effective on January 1st. It's Assembly Bill 992. It's the attempt by the legislature to deal with uh, social media such as Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and trying to relate it to the Brown Act. And in general, um, the, the legislature is trying to balance a recognition that in the world we live in now, that social media can be a really important tool for decision makers and commissioners such as yourself um, to provide information to the public or to receive feedback from the public. So in general, the law says that um, members of the legislative body can use social media platforms to answer questions, provide information to the public um, or solicit information. And then consistent with what I said earlier about things like emails or ongoing meetings, uh, they're not, uh, Brown Act bodies are not permitted to use social media platforms to communicate with other legislative bodies constituting a majority of the legislative uh, body about business that's a, the nature that's within the subject matter. The, the point is the same, that you can't use this tool to hold an unnoticed meeting, just like you can't use email or other tools. If we can go to the next slide, please. This one is to me even more, a little more interesting, which is that uh, even if there's not a, an issue of a quorum of a legislative body like the commission, the, the legislature has really discouraged and prohibited uh, members from posting or having reactions to uh, posts of other uh, members of their elected body. So I have no idea whether any of you are active uh, social media users, but to the extent that you are, uh, just be aware that, that generally the law is not favoring a lot of interaction among members of the same body um, on Facebook um, or other social media platforms. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. There are exceptions, which I'm not gonna cover hugely tonight, but um, they're pretty commonsensically to me. For example, um, all of you might go to a fire district conference uh, and that's completely fine. Um, there's an exception for attending meetings of other local agencies that are agenda that are agendized in our Brown Act meetings because there might be an issue, for example, the county's consideration uh, in October that a more than a quorum of you might be able might might have wanted to attend. There's an exception for that. There's purely social or ceremonial occasions, and then the rule for all of these is that provided that a majority of the members do not discuss among themselves other than a part of the scheduled program specific business that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body. What I would say is I've represented um, jurisdictions where there was a, 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 a tradition to, for example, have lunch before the afternoon meeting among the board, mem among the board members. 
Um, generally, we've tried to discourage that. Um, we've even had monitors of, of those lunches to make sure that they're not talking about matters within the jurisdiction of the agency. Um, but we, but the Brown Act recognizes there are times going to be things like retirement parties, um, those sorts of things, maybe holiday events. And the goal there is just that maybe uh, a majority of the members don't sit together, don't interact publicly, because even if they're complying with the Brown Act rules and not talking about things um, within the jurisdiction, we're still trying to create a solid public perception that we take the Brown Act seriously and that uh, we're not even creating an appearance of any kind of Brown Act issue. You can go to the next slide. Um, uh, I think, yeah. So we all, these are pretty basic. Um, we have a notice agenda tonight uh, because of COVID. It's mostly available on the internet. It's not posted. It, it is posted at the county uh, currently. Not many people are going to the county to look at it. Um, go to the next slide. And then um, to me, this is one of the most important aspects of the Brown Act is that the members of the public should be able to monitor the agenda of a public agency and be very confident as to what items are going to be discussed. It's a really great efficiency tool that if a member of the public has an item that they particularly care about, that they're confident that if it's not on the agenda, that it's not going to be discussed uh, at a meeting or at a hearing and that way they don't have to uh, monitor every single meeting. Um, so in general, we will have this discipline on this commission. Um, there are limited exceptions for things like emergencies, but in general, we won't be taking, taking action or discussing items that are not on the agenda for the particular commission meeting. And there are limited exceptions, which we also follow here, which include things like briefly responding to statements uh, or, uh, or questions posed by the member of the public, asking a question for clarification. And then most importantly, if a member of the public were to bring uh, up or a member of commission were to bring up an item that's not on the agenda for that particular meeting, the Brown Act allows there to be a request for staff to bring a report back on the item or even potentially through uh, President Warren, a request for staff to authorize a particular matter of business to be discussed at a future meeting. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm not gonna cover this in any detail because we follow this, but generally there's transparency around uh, public decision-making regarding salaries. If we go to the next slide. Um, public comment. We follow these rules as well. Generally, public comment needs to be before or during consideration of an agenda item for obvious reasons. If public comment is after the board has taken action, it defeats a fundamental purpose of the Brown Act. Uh, we also allow a comment period for non-agendized items. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. Um, what, this is less um, relevant now with uh, Zoom meetings, but in general, public members of the public have a right to record the meeting and they have a right um, to uh, record or and or broadcast the meeting as long as it doesn't disrupt the meeting. Next slide. Um, in terms of public access to documents, in general, the rule is that uh, the member of the public should get the document at the same time that a majority of the legislative body are getting uh, the documents. We follow that generally that everything is posted to our website at the same time it's distributed to the commission. Um, it's again, a little bit different with COVID, but general writing distribute, writings distributed during a public meeting by the staff or a member of the uh, commission will be made available for public inspection during the meeting if it's distributed during the meeting. And then if it's prepared by a member of the public, it's generally made available after the meeting, although in certain circumstances, the clerk might go and make copies uh, and provide it during the meeting. Next slide. Uh, we follow this as well. It's relatively recent uh, change in the law over the last few years. We have to identify each individual vote of each commissioner and how they voted on each item. Most of the time they're unanimous votes. And so it's sufficient for the clerk to note that the vote was unanimous. However, if there's not a unanimous vote, each item needs to be uh, stated for the record. Next slide. We're gonna skip this. This is generally applies when a member of a commission uh, or a legislative body wants to attend a meeting remotely, like they may be at home or they may be on vacation or lobbying in Washington, DC. Um, there's an opportunity to do that subject to a bunch of rules right now. However, uh, we're con conducting all of our meetings virtually. So we'll save that discussion for another time. Uh, next slide. We're also gonna skip this. In general, there are times where Legislative bodies are, are, are authorized to go into closed session. To me, they're very commonsensical, things like uh, litiga discussing litigation strategy, discussing price in terms of real estate transactions, 
discussing, uh, this was put in after 9-11, uh, certain threats to public services or facilities. We haven't gone into closed session in, um, in this commission. One of the things we might go into closed session for is to do staff evaluations, uh, which obviously are generally not done in public, but we'll cover closed sessions if and when we uh, go into closed session. If we go to the next slide. And obviously um, the Brown Act um, has penalties for um, its violation that can include things like invalidating uh, the action and generally having to redo the action um, as well as uh, intentional violations can be uh, criminal in nature. Um, and so we, that's why we um, pay attention to it. And also just, I think that the overall goals of the Brown Act are very laud laudatory. I believe in them a lot and uh, therefore we try to follow them. So um, I think that's the end of the Brown Act slide presentation. I wanted to give people uh, a chance to ask questions as I move into the next topic, if anyone has any questions on the Brown Act. All right, thank you. But, so the next topic is generally conflicts of interest, if we could put that up. And I, I, as I mentioned, I am gonna cover this um, relatively quickly. Um, it's not something that I like to rush through uh, because it's relatively, um, uh, can be relatively complicated. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so conceptually, uh, and again, I'm speaking to people who may be very familiar with this area of law, as well as maybe uh, commissioners or others who are less familiar with it. The general idea, as it sounds, is to avoid conflicts of interest. And the typical conflict of interest would be a conflict between someone's personal interest and their interest as a commissioner, where they have a duty to act uh, primarily for the benefit of the public. And then the other thing I would emphasize is that the Conflict of interest laws in California really focus on financial interests, but sometimes we have to remember that um, it can, in certain points, be based on more than just financial interests. So there's case law that relates to what are called common law conflicts of interest. And then there's what I would call um, the goal that we have at the county and that we have at the district. And that is to avoid even the appearance of any kind of conflict. So even if I could give you a private, um, or the FPPC, Fair Political Practices Commission, could find a way to give a, a, an opinion that would say that technically it is not a financial conflict. That doesn't mean that you might still not want to or need to recuse yourself on the basis of, of like I said, a goal of avoiding even the appearance of impropriety or what we would call the smell test, or it just doesn't sound right, or how would this look on the front page of the Mercury News or the San Jose Insight. So that's the goal that we're trying to reach, which is really to avoid even a question that there's any kind of, uh, of conflict. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so I already mentioned that uh, in general, if there is a conflict uh, of interest of a financial or other nature, the general rule is that the public official can comply with the law um, by not participating in that uh, conflict. However, I'll cover with you later the exception for commissioners such as yourself um, uh, involving uh, government conflicts in contracts, uh, which basically presume that because you're a board member, you are participating in that, uh, you're, you're participating in that matter. So um, generally speaking, and we're not gonna cover this in a huge detail, but the idea here is that you have a disqualifying financial interest if the government decision will have a material effect on you, your immediate family, or your uh, personal financial interests. If we go to the next slide. Um, and, and generally the conflicts include both disclosure requirements. And then, as I mentioned earlier, disqualification requirements. We'll go to the next slide. Um, Corey mentioned earlier the filing of, of uh, Form 700 disclosure statements. I believe they're due on April 1st. I file them uh, based upon uh, my job at County Council. The uh, generally elected officials and the district attorney uh, and others are specifically named in the government code. and then. In addition to that, individuals are designated in a agency's conflict of interest code, and you are all designated filers in the agency's conflict of interest code, which means you have to, you, you have to fill out these Form 700 um, reports on an annual basis. Next slide, please. Um, and in general, um, the what you report on your Form 700 uh, are some of the interests that might result in a conflict of interest, 
um, but there are other interests that could result in a conflict of interest that aren't reported. And the easiest example of that would be, we don't just generally report our primary residence for purposes of the Form 700. Um, however, to the extent that a primary residence was very proximate to uh, something that the, the, the um, commission was deliberating upon, even though it wasn't reported on your Form 700, it might result in a uh, need to recuse yourself. So for example, our Horseshoe Lane, I don't know that any of you live within close proximity to Horseshoe Lane, the property owned by the district that we're talking about doing um, uh, work on to make it usable for fire response and other purposes. For the sake of argument, if someone uh, lived right next door to that uh, Horseshoe Lane property, uh, they would generally have an interest in their property and arguably whatever the district would do on that property might have a material effect on the value of the property, either negatively or positively. Um, and as a result, generally that commissioner or a public employee would recuse themselves uh, from that decision. And then the other financial interests are things like salaries and wages, rental property income, gross income from any sale. Um, next slide, please income from investment interests, such as partnerships, clients uh, of a business official owns. So, so the easy example would be many of the Board of Supervisor members, because we have a hospital um, and we do a couple billion dollars of contracting a year, many of the Board of Supervisor members own stock in large companies uh, that do business with the county. There are exceptions um, in terms of how much stock ownership there is, how much income there are, but in general, you will hear the Board of Supervisor members say that they won't be participating in a particular uh, vote um, involving uh, some, someone that they own stock, a company that they own stock in. Uh, next slide. And again, all of this has to be individually analyzed. I'm doing a very brief overview. Um, similarly, uh, we report on our Form 700, things like uh, tickets or passes to sporting events, uh, meals, generally more than $50, uh, fees for paid by someone um, to participate in things like golf courses. What I try to say at my training generally is that it's just not worth accepting the free meal. It's not worth accept, accepting the free ticket to have to worry about reporting it, to have to worry about it being in the paper. Um, I, I generally try not to do that. I mean, sort of my, um, my joke in giving this training is just that when I started working at the county, the Warriors, the Sharks, uh, the Giants, they were all winning the World Series. And, and, uh, were great and I was getting a lot of calls at four o'clock from a county employee saying hey Chris I'm getting offered uh, tickets to the World Series at the Giants for tonight can I go what are my obligations and so I would have to run through okay well you're gonna have to report it it's more than $500 um, who, who is giving you the ticket do they have business in front of the county is it a corporation that you might have a vote on those are the types of issues we get into on conflict of interest issues and for me, it's just a lot easier to not accept those things and not uh, not have to worry about the reporting and other requirements that might result in a, in a conflict. Um, next slide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, investments. We'll go to the next slide. Real property interests. I talked about that. Next slide. Again, this is too much detail for the amount of time I have. Business business decisions, personal finances. These are all examples of potential financial interests that could result in a conflict. Next slide, please. Um, and I mentioned under the Political Reform Act, generally, um, you can disqualify yourself uh, due to a financial interest. And so the example there would be that someone living next to um, the district owned property could recuse themselves from a decision based on its impact to their property. Uh, however, I'm going to cover in a second. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to cover in a second the difference between the Political Reform Act, which is a government decision that's involved in a financial interest of a public employee, and then what's called Government Code Section 1090. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, government Code Section 1090 relates to conflicts involving contracts, which I'm going to cover in a second. But in terms of both uh, the Political Reform Act and Government Code Section 1090, um, I would just mention that the law is very broad about what constitutes participating in a government decision. So the easy ones are on the left part of the slide, which things like votes, 
um, things like um, entering into a contractual agreement, authorizing or directing an action, but it's much more than that under the conflict of interest law. It, it can include things like providing information or an opinion. So for example, saying to staff, hey, th this contractor isn't a good contractor um, and that leading to a decision, even if the official ultimately recuses themselves leading to a change in the decision-making process towards awarding to a different contractor. And then also even using your position to influence a decision, even if you don't um, particularly um, uh, participate in the formal vote. And the best example I have of that is a former public agency I used to represent, sort of the um, one of the decision makers wanted to be in sort of in the room glaring at the staff while the decision was being made, even though they were um, re recused. And we had to ask that person, no, you really have to leave the room after you announce your recusal, because even if you're not participating, even your body language is showing how you're feeling about this. And you can imagine they weren't very happy to uh, to get that advice, but that would be, another example would be sort of behind the scenes meetings with staff to change the staff's point of view, uh, even though you're not participating, uh, commissioner might not be participating in the public process. Uh, next slide, please. And then this goes over uh, disqualification uh, from an item where, you, where a uh, public agency employee or board member has a conflict. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and we'll go to the next slide as well. Too much detail for this, this uh, topic. Uh, next slide as well. This is for future reference. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll go to the next slide as well. And then th this is really the, the, the key point of, of this, which is that if we're dealing in a situation that involves the district's approval of a contract, special rules apply, and that's known as government code section 1090. I mentioned it earlier. And that is a broad prohibi prohibition. And the idea here is that you don't want the public official to be on both sides of the contract, both in their official capacity, as well as in their private capacity. So the easy example would be, uh, just to use a county example, the public agency employee uh, works at uh, Valley Medical Center relating to procurement of ambulance contracts. And it turns out that their spouse or partner or significant other works for a private ambulance company. Uh, and therefore, if that private ambulance company uh, were to get the contract, it would benefit uh, the spouse and therefore it would benefit the public uh, employee. Um, now this applies um, to board members, officers, employees, and then this is very important too in certain circumstances, even independent contractors uh, of the public entity. So this would include potentially people who are consultants to the district, but act in a decision-making role. So the idea here I think is that the legislature doesn't want there to be structure around, well, this person's an, an, an officer um, or employee um, and not a contractor, and therefore the contractor can avoid uh, the conflict of interest requirements and in contracts. It actually, um, specifically, there's case law around independent contractors who become public officials or public employees for purposes of 1090. Next slide, please. Again, contracts are read very broadly to include contracts, amendments, purchase orders, grants. Next slide, please. And then again, um, what does it mean to be financially interested in a contract? Courts have been very broad in construing this to cover any interest that prevents an official from exercising absolute loyalty and undivided allegiance to the public entity. That's an incredibly high standard uh, to meet. Essentially, we've looked at it and we view that to be, for example, in a situation where a um, public agency uh, board member might be a board member of a nonprofit entity uh, there are lots of nonprofits at the county that are social service providers um, where an accounting employee might be a board member of a social service provider, even if they're not receiving financial um, compensation as their service on a nonprofit, they would generally have a fidu fiduciary duty to that nonprofit at, to act as a board member. And that fiduciary duty would co potentially could co co potentially conflict uh, with their duties as a county employee. And so we um, generally uh, would recommend that they would, for example, recuse themselves uh, from acting uh, in their county role if they're gonna act as a uh, nonprofit board member. For you, uh, next slide, please. Um, again, I said earlier about participating is read very broadly to include things like creating uh, specs, 
preliminary discussions, negotiation. It's more than just voting on the end contract. Next slide, please. And then this is really important because it applies to board members. I mentioned earlier that generally employees can recuse themselves to avoid the conflict. For board members, uh, generally the presumption is that even if the board member recuses themselves, they're still presumed uh, to have participated in making the contract. Um, and, and therefore for you as board members, generally you can't recuse your way out of a conflict that's based on uh, a contract. And there are very specific both remote interests and non-interests that are defined by state law um, that are very detailed uh, that um, I don't have time to go into, into tonight, but the general rule is for board members different from employees, the board members can't uh, recuse themselves to avoid a conflict under government code section 1090. Next slide, please. Uh, these are, again, uh, just generally those non-interests uh, and they, there, there are roughly 14 of them uh, that are too, too much to go into for tonight, but we can talk about if these issues come up at a later date. Next slide, please. Similarly for remote interests, if we can go to the next slide, please. And then uh, this one obviously is not hopefully ever gonna come up for the district, but uh, the legislature a couple of years ago passed uh, legislation to deal with the idea that individual members of the public, even though they're not public officials, could have liability for essentially aiding and abetting public officials to uh, commit government code section 1090 violations. Next slide, please. And then, as I mentioned, uh, government code section 1090, depending on intention, um, can include uh, up to and not up to and including criminal penalties. And uh, similar to um, the Brown Act can result in invalidation of governmental decision-making processes. So any questions on the conflict, very abbreviated conflict presentation that I just gave? Yes. I have a question. Uh, yes. So uh, in terms of the Form 700, and its reporting uh, requirements. Am I correct in presuming that uh, rental property that is not within the district, but in another city or town is not required to be reported? I believe one of the slides says that it's within the district boundaries and within a two mile radius of the district boundaries. Okay. Um, the fire district is very unique relative to the county because the fire district boundaries are not very intuitive. But in answer to your question, generally, yes, it relates to property within the district or two miles uh, around the district boundaries. The district boundaries are, like I said, a little bit complicated. Um, and so that's the general rule. All right. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? All right, we are in the home stretch here. Um, so I wanna just talk very briefly about the Public Records Act. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the Public Records Act is, um, is constitutional in nature. There was a constitutional amendment by voter initiative. Um, and I mentioned that just to say that that's how seriously California takes the Public Records Act. Um, the other thing to know about the Public Records Act is in general, there's an attorney's fees shifting provision where if a public agency doesn't comply with the Public Records Act and a member of the public goes to court and is able to essentially get those records um, in contradiction with, with what the um, public agency did, the member of the public's entitled to have their attorney's fees paid. Um, and, and that sort of risk shifting provision is, is really important to keep in mind uh, because in some cases those uh, Public Records Act, even if they're relatively simple uh, records can result in very large liability uh, for public records. And that in addition to sort of the requirement and constitu constitutional nature of transparency, we also are very careful to avoid any violation of the Public Records Act uh, for the attorney's fees uh, reason as well. Um, and in general, the idea is similar to the Brown Act that everything that the public um, uh, agency does uh, in terms of its records should be uh, available to the public with some exceptions that I'll, I'll go into. If we can go to the next slide. Um, writing is defined very broadly uh, to include um, things like recordings, uh, things like uh, pictures, uh, in some cases, uh, information contained on public agency servers, 
And then really the, um, uh, the really the biggest one is emails. That's really the purpose of the training is for those of you who haven't worked in a public agency environment to recognize that everything that you write for the most part, uh, either on, uh, uh, we don't really have district um, infrastructure that you're using like you would at the county, but to the extent you're using your own personal devices, which I'll cover in a second, uh, for to, to conduct his district business under the California Supreme Court's decision in the city of San Jose case a couple of years ago, um, those are generally uh, public records as well. Um, it's important to note that uh, a public agency doesn't have a duty to create a new record in response to a CPRA request. Generally, it only has a duty to, re to uh, produce records that already exist. And that comes up quite a bit. So a public agency for, for the sake of customer service or public policy can choose to respond uh, to questions of members of the public. But if it's a public records act, they're only obligated to to, to provide existing records. They're not obligated to create um, new records. And the key questions, as we said, as I said, is does it relate to the con conduct of the people's business? And that's, um, that's read incredibly broadly. Um, and, and, and is it prepared, owned, or used, or retained by the public agency? If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and I mentioned, I already mentioned this, that it, it the legislature specifically includes things like uh, photos, emails, voicemails, text, computer data, all of these different things are all considered writings under the CPRA. Next slide, please. Um, and I wanna just generally, uh, I do this in every training I give um, and I would feel like I was not doing my job if I didn't do it. Um, that whole concept of everything that you put in writing an email that relates to your work as a commissioner um, being, um, unless there's a specific exemption, for example, it's attorney-client privileged uh, would be an example. The idea that that could and probably is a public record that could be um, produced in a public record doc request and could end up um, on the front page of, uh, of the Merck News is just so important to keep in mind. And sort of the best example I have is a public agency that I previously um, represented. Um, there was an unfortunate uh, back and forth among two count two uh, public agency employees having a back and forth about a particular member of the public who had business in front of the, of the public agency. And uh, they felt like, well, it's not really official, but it was done during the workday, it was done on county computers. And so I was in a position of having those very um, uh, unflattering emails uh, blown up and put in federal court in San Jose. Uh, and it reflected really, really poorly on the public agency I represented. So I always mention that to say that uh, we always want to make sure everything that we put in writing is uh, could potentially be a public record. And we want to make sure that, uh, that um, unless there's a specific exception that applies, um, that we um, uh, recognize that. Um, sometimes it's better, and even in my practice, sometimes it's better to pick up the phone and have a phone conversation uh, and have a conversation about a particular matter and not necessarily have um, a long back and forth. There are sort of iterations of the rule, like what happens if I send a attorney-client privileged uh, email to a client and that client then tells someone else or sends an email to someone else um, uh, regarding the information that I gave. Did my attorney-client privilege potentially get waived by that um, by the forwarding of that email and therefore it's no longer a public record? These are all issues that um, we sort of uh, stay awake at night. So the so the, the, the fundamental takeaway here is that everything that you're doing um, uh, for this uh, agency uh, that it involves a record could potentially be um, disclosed as a public record. And then really the not very surprising result of the Supreme Court case in the city of San Jose case a couple of years ago was that just because it's in your personal Google or Gmail or Yahoo email account and or just because it's on the personal cell phone that you pay for um, that you're texting that if it relates to the business of the public agency that you're working for in general um, that is a public record and just because the, the public agency doesn't control that technology uh, doesn't make it not a public record so how do you mitigate against that well one of the things that we tell people at the county is first of all to create um, and use my understanding is um, and uh, the staff can correct me, but you all have um, Los Altos County Fire District email addresses. Is that, that's correct, right? So to try to use those email addresses, you do not. Chair, 
Mr. Tyson saying? Some of us do, some of us don't. It's not, okay. it's not complete. Okay. So the recommendation would be that to the extent you can, that you have those email addresses and that you conduct the business of the commission on those email addresses. And the reason why is because that way, if there was a, a, a Public Records Act request for, for example, email correspondence relating to a particular issue, that it would be very identifiable to look through your uh, county fire district um, email address and then um, produce those records to the extent that those records are mixed in an email account that includes, for example, your business email and or uh, your personal email. The nightmare scenario that we don't want to have to do is to have you or a member of county council uh, have to go through you know, 10,000 emails in your personal email account and try to identify every email that relates to Los, Alto Los Altos County fire business and specifically the topic in which the Public Records Act request was asked for. That's one approach. The other approach, which doesn't necessarily work for Los, Alto, Los Altos Hills County Fire, is to have a separate um, cell phone uh, uh, for, for your public business uh, versus your private business. Now, the courts, it's not in the state law or in the case, but the courts have said as a sort of um, compromise solution uh, based on a decision in the state of Washington that in the situation where those emails are um, sort of mixed between public emails and your private emails, uh, that you can sign a sworn declaration under oath that says that you've gone through all of the emails and you've produced all the public uh, record related emails um, that you've produced. We're not sure in California whether that is 100% enforceable. And again, that's just not a decision that's not a situation that we necessarily want people to be in uh, to, to be going through thousands of emails uh, for the sake of this. And I will say too, that we routinely uh, in the county council's office uh, go through uh, many hundreds of emails in response to a particular uh, email request. And we have to potentially determine um, whether they're privileged, i.e. they involve attorney-client communication, whether parts of them are, need to be redacted for privacy reasons, um, and uh, it's quite a, can be quite a large um, body of work. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned some of the exemptions. There are exemptions for things like preliminary drafts. So when Jay is working on a staff report for the commission, we want the commission and the public to only see the final version. We don't want the commission to see uh, all of the draft versions under the theory that we want the best possible version to, to be made public. Uh, we also want internal staff communications to be able to be candid uh, resulting in the best possible recommendations. Not surprisingly, things like uh, records relating to pending litigation, personnel or medical files, and then records uh, relating to other existing privileges, such as the attorney-client privilege, are, exempt, uh, are possible exemptions to the CPRA. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned, we also redact, uh, and we also work a lot with our clients regarding application of the exemptions of the CPRA. Next slide, please. Um, some of the misconceptions about CPRAs is that they don't have to be in writing, they can be orally. The requester doesn't have to mention the CPRA. Um, there is an, an obligation on the part of the public agency to assist the requester with the request. In, in addition, we're allowed to ask the requester for clarification uh, to allow us to identify the record. In some cases, we might argue that a request is overbroad and is going to be producing, you know, thousands and thousands of records and it's not efficient for us to respond. But in general, we have to make a very good faith effort to respond to each request. Next slide, slide please. Uh, any, any person, not surprisingly, it doesn't matter who the person is who's requesting the public record, anybody can request a public record and they're all treated the same. It doesn't matter why they're requ requesting the public record. They don't have to give a reason why they're doing it. They also don't have to give an, uh, their identity or their contact information for making the request. Next slide, please. And then this is more for staff because I don't think any of you would be uh, personally trying to comply with the public records, but in general, we have to reply within 10 days uh, of whether or not we have the record. In certain circumstances, we can, we can extend that for 14 days. To the extent we identify records with a relatively straightforward search, we've got to do it promptly. If, if the records are in different locations or are difficult to find, uh, we can produce them on a rolling basis. Next slide, please. And in general, again, this is a bit of a misconception as well. Sometimes 
that generally that we can only charge for the direct copying costs. There's some exceptions for things like uh, computer programming time. But in general, like for example, in county council, we might spend 100 hours on a particular um, CPRA request response. And in general, we're not allowed to charge the member of the public for the cost to produce that uh, response um, and, and or uh, process the request. My hope would be that the staff, if there is a CPRA request of the district, the staff would be working with me uh, to respond to it. It wouldn't necessarily be the commission or individual commissioners that would be responding. You should, if you get a public records act request, you should uh, refer it to staff and then we would determine an appropriate uh, response. Next slide, please. And then again, as I mentioned, um, uh, the is issue with CPRA compliance is that potential for a big attorney's fee award. Next slide, please. That's it? That's it. Great, and I'm sorry, I did go quite a bit over my intention. I apologize. Um, I tried to go as quickly as possible. I'd be happy to answer any comments or questions that you might have. And I owe President Warren, I think, because we promised that we would try to get out close to nine. So we'll have to make that it was up. a lot. We'll have to make it up in a future meeting, President Warren. I apologize. That was a lot to cover. Thank you. Jay, anything else on that topic? <clears throat> oh, well done. Thank you all to the speakers for that special study session uh, under agenda item 12. I hope it was very worthwhile. It gives the new commissioners a really warm welcome as to the details of governance and the legal aspects of governance and also refreshes all the other commissioners and staff. So I think it was a very worthwhile endeavor and thank you all to the speakers and to the staff for your attention that you, you paid. Uh, end of my comments. Great, thank you everyone. Is there any further discussion from the commission? Is there any public comment on this item? Hearing none, we'll move on to item 13, commission member reports. Uh, 13, 13A, future agenda items. Um, item A if, is future agenda items. Next month, the commission will receive an overview and orientation from Central Fire and District um, Engineering Consultant uh, from Friar and Lera, Lariata. That will be the second part of this is uh, General Manager Logan um, mentioned earlier today was the governance and next week we'll go more into the operational aspect or not next week next month with an overview of central fire and with um, our engineering firm that does a lot of the work around the civil engineering for the district does the com do commissioners or staff any of any additional topics they'd like to add to future agendas okay I don't hear any at this time. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? Hearing none, we'll now move to item 14, which is the adjournment. This concludes the February 16th, 2021 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The meeting is adjourned at 9.30 p.m. The next regular meeting will take place via Zoom on March 16th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Special Project Services Consultant Hendricks, please stop the recording. <laughs>